Hello, and welcome back to the Formal Review. Today, we'll be talking about the 2021 film, Jungle Cruise. Now sit back, relax, grab your drinks, and let's talk about this movie. What's up, y'all, and welcome back to the Formal Review. This is Season 4, Episode 13, and I thank you all for tuning in once again. So this episode, we'll be going into the newest film based on a ride and the stories behind it all. So stay tuned. Have you ever thought about starting your own podcast? When I was trying to get this podcast off the ground, I had a lot of questions like, how do I record an episode? How do I get my show into all the apps that people like to listen on? How do I make money from my podcast? The answer to every single one of those questions is really simple. Anchor. Anchor is a one-stop shop for recording, hosting, and distributing my podcast. And best of all, it's absolutely 100% free and ridiculously easy to use. And now Anchor can match you with some great sponsors. That means you can get paid to podcast right away. In fact, that's exactly what I'm doing right now. So if you've always wanted to start a podcast and make money doing it, go to anchor.fm forward slash start to join me and the diverse community of podcasters already already using anchor again that's anchor.fm forward slash start and i can't wait to hear your podcast Now, before I get into anything, I do want to preface this episode with a slight spoiler warning. As always, I will do my best not to ruin the movie for you. However, I do suggest that you go watch the film prior to hearing what I have to say about it, just in case I do say something that may ruin the movie for you. I will do my best to keep the analysis as vague as possible, so not to ruin the movie for you. However, if you do not care about that, keep listening. Also, I know I talk about this at the end, but the data shows that most people don't listen to that part, so I want to talk about it here and reiterate the importance of leaving reviews on your favorite subscription services. I do read those because I do want to grow because these episodes are really for all you listeners out there and I want to keep this entertaining. So what do you want to hear? Do you want to hear games? Do you want to hear more of the 4K stuff? Do you want to hear me talk about a certain movie? If you want to come on and talk to me about something for you want to debate, I'm always open to do stuff like that. So you can always reach out to me on social media. I always want to grow and improve and just put something works doesn't mean that it cannot be improved so if there's something that you want me to improve on let me know and i will grow as such anyway now on to the movie at hand let's sit back relax grab your drinks let's talk about this movie Jungle Cruise is a 2021 fantasy adventure film directed by Wame Koletsera from a screenplay written by Glenn Ficarra, John Requa, and Michael Green. It is based on the Walt Disney theme park attraction from the same name. Now, from the beginning, Disney wanted another movie that was based on a theme park attraction since the success of Pirates of the Caribbean. Now, this ride opened in the Disneyland Park in July of 1955. Since then, Jungle Cruise has become one of the most iconic attractions at Disney theme park, so much so that it is cloned to pretty much every single Disney resort around the world. Now the ride's origins actually go back to the 1940s when Walt Disney Pictures began production of their True Life Adventure series and they ended up staging wildlife documentaries that followed various groups of animals in their natural habitat. The series was so successful with everyone from typical moviegoers and critics that it eventually evolved into full-length documentary films and with the success Walt Disney himself planned on including something related to this series in his park from the beginning and it was originally going to be called True Life Adventureland which obviously was later shortened to Adventureland. Now Walt actually originally wanted to have real life animals which was obviously stopped for logistical reasons. The ride opened with the rest of the park on July 17th 1955. However at the time there was no ad-libbed humor from the skippers. It was more of a serious ride and the ride like the overall park was a massive success but as the park reached its 10 year mark Walt wanted these new things now there's this legend out there that states that he once overheard a child ask his mother to ride the jungle cruise but was then surprised when she told the child that they had ridden it last time they were here and they didn't need to do it again no idea if this story is true or not but either way in the early 1960s Walt brought over a new animator just to soup up the rides and they started to add in some comedic elements 
elements such as the ride skipper narration and then the fandom end of it all coming back. However, despite Jungle Cruise's ongoing popularity even today, it has not been without controversy. Particularly, it has had negative depictions of natives, specifically the quote headhunter and quote party, as well as the trader Sam quote head salesman character. Not until earlier this year in 2021 was this changed. In January, Disney announced that it would be making a significant story change to the Jungle Cruise to alleviate these issues. Now, Carmen Smith, who is the creative development and inclusion strategist executive at Walt Disney Imagineering, explained that, quote, as Imagineers, it is our responsibility to ensure experiences we create and the stories we share reflect the voice and perspective of the world around us. With Jungle Cruise, we are bringing to life more of what people love, the humor and wit of our incredible skippers while making needed updates, end quote. Additionally, Chief Executive Bob Iger added, quote, the existing changes we're making to one of Disney's most popular classic attractions, Jungle Cruise, reflect our commitment to creating unparalleled experience, end quote. Though they also made it clear that these changes to the attraction were not going to be related to this film. Now, this film stars Dwayne Johnson, Emily Blunt, Edgar Ramirez, Jack Whitehall, Jesse Plemons, and Paul Giamatti. The film star production actually back in 2004 following the success of, as I mentioned, the first Pirates of the Caribbean film, but it remained fairly dormant at the time. Then, back in 2011, it was brought up again when Tom Hanks or thought Tim Allen were set to star. But then Johnson was cast in August of 2015, and then Blunt was cast in the following January. Now, this film was originally supposed to be released last year, but it was delayed due to the COVID-19 pandemic, and thus it was released in the United States on July 30th, 2021, simultaneously in theaters and also on through Disney Plus with Premiere Access. Now, this film was also released on the 4DX format. Now, for those who don't know, 4DX is a type of cinema that gives viewing more than a visual and audible treat. It adds in various practical effects, including motion seats, wind, strobe lights, snow, and scents, and gives moviegoers this multi-central cinema-going experience, allowing audiences to connect through the motion and the vibration through all these practical effects that really enhance the visuals on screens. And each auditorium incorporates this with many different aspects. And as of this recording, there's about 773 40X auditoriums across the world in 67 different countries. It's really crazy that you really do feel like you're in the movie. And a lot of you know who have been listening know that I'm a big fan of that format. However, I was not able to check that out because by the time I was able to make it to the theater, the Suicide Squad, which I talked about in the last episode, took over that format and they can only really do one at a time. I am a little sad though, based on what I've read about this 40X experience because apparently the film scenes in the rapids were particularly good. Water from the rapids and also rain in other scenes got some viewers wet and there's some great wind effects and smoke for the explosions and fire and then also lightning flashing. And there's also smells thrown in such as the smell of an engine oil or a smell of fires burning. And I'm really sad to have missed this screening and hopefully it'll come back. I saw this on a very basic theater screen, nothing too special. I will say it looked fine. However, I will say I am excited for the 4K UHD, especially for some of the colors that come from the tree of life and the sound that comes from the river and the LFV that comes for it when I'm able to buy this on the 4K Ultra HD. Anyway, back to the movie. So this film follows the captain, Frank, played by Johnson, of a small river boat who takes Lily, who is a scientist played by Brunt, and her brother played by Whitehall through the jungle in search of the tree of life. Now, while the story itself is fictional, it has some real life historical figures and also ideologies. The story takes place in 1916, which is when World War I was starting, and there was a lot of international tension, and women like Lily had very little to say in the scientific community. The main society in the film is known as the Association, which is this misogynistic group of middle-aged white British men who don't regard women highly in their society or even consider them for membership. It's almost a club that has the rule of no girls allowed! 
talk. In the film, Lily usually makes her brother do the speeches because she's not allowed to take the floor to do so. Now, this obviously alludes to the overly misogynistic regulations of the World War I era. Additionally, Lily faces discrimination for her adventurous and different lifestyle, and many men throughout the film make fun of her for wearing pants instead of the norm, aka dresses. Furthermore, these scientific societies were also very real, and the film clearly takes inspiration from London's real-life historical Royal Society, which was a scientific institution that conducted research and education across the globe. But it didn't accept women as members until 1945. Now, Lily and her brother ventured to the Amazon in search of the Tier of the Moon, which is a magical tree that's also referred to as the Tree of Life. Now, its petals are said to treat any ailment or break any curse. Now, Lily's main desire to use this Tears of the Moon to greatly benefit modern medicine. Not only does this tree get its basis from Disney's Animal Kingdom tree of the same name, but it also is based on many real-life religious and spiritual mythologies representing immortality, fertility, and healing. Now, along the way, they run into Prince Joachim, son of the Kaiser, who, in fact, was a real person. Now, he was as much a caricature as he was in this film, but he was the sixth child and youngest son of Germans Kaiser Wilhelm. Though, in real life, he was never sent on a mission to find a magical savior of the war. Instead, he actually was being advocated by Dublin's Republicans to sit on the Irish throne in 1916. Tragically, the prince ended up taking his own life at the age of 29. Now, the main antagonist of this film was Don Aguirre, the Spanish conquistador who went to South America to search for the Tears of the Moon. And he's actually based on a real-life Spanish conquistador, Lope de Aguirre, who is known as a madman adventurer during the 16th century. Now, his final expedition is very similar to the one that his counterpart does in the film. Now, in real life, he travels down the Amazon in search of this mythical kingdom of El Dorado. And he actually did this journey with his daughter, which I'll get to more on in a minute. Now, on this expedition, he ended up giving himself the name of Prince of Peru, Tierra Firme, and murdered many natives or anyone who tried to capture him. In the end, he was murdered by those who succeeded in destroying his tyrannical reign. Now, Disney's version is slightly less murdersome, and in some ways, he's an anti-hero, because one could honestly feel for him as the fiction version has him searching for a cure for his sick daughter instead of being greedy and looking for golden riches. Now, he still does some of the menacing things that the real life version does, but that's kind of downplayed because obviously it's a Disney movie. So let's back away from that a little bit, obviously. Now, the film itself does take some inspiration from Indiana Jones movies, and even the star's costumes are very similar to John Huston's The African Queen, which stars Humphrey Bogart and Katherine Hepburn. However, unlike that movie, the interactions between the two main characters is significantly less significant. Now, their romantic chemistry is non-existent, save from few moments, such as when he picks up her old hand crank silent film camera and captures these very affectionate images of her. But the rest of the movie, they seem more like a brother and sister than a couple. Had they kept the entire relationship a non-romantic one, the movie would probably have been a whole lot better. And honestly, Blunt puts a lot more effort into this quote-unquote romance romance than Johnson does, but honestly, that's not why you watch a movie like this. You really watch it for the charisma of the actors and them participating in action scenes and the journey that they're on. Fortunately, the film really does well in those moments. Now, Blunt and Johnson are fairly good outside of their forced relationship and are able to create this irresistible slash immovable object dynamic that is very well done. And director Colette Sarah has really created a film that honestly may feels familiar to some, but it's still a decent family movie. When Lily and her brother hire Frank to be their skipper, there's obviously a lot of homages to the original ride. Frank's job is taking tourists up river while making very cheesy jokes that are very similar to those on the actual ride. Now, a lot of these jokes are so-called dad jokes, and if you enjoy these types of jokes, it's quite funny at times. It's honestly purposely cheesy, and frankly, Die 
back for that. <laughs> anyway, one could roll their eyes at these jokes, but one with a big smile on their face. And honestly, it's almost as big as The Rock because it's purposefully cheesy. Additionally, the supporting cast in this film is a lot of fun. Like Paul Giamatti playing this gold tooth and sunburned and very cartoon, quote unquote, Italian harbor master who delights at keeping Frank in debt. Now, honestly, it's really hard for me to believe that that character is somewhat intimidating to The Rock whose muscles seem to be bursting from his shirt as in most Rock projects, but whatever, sure, that I'll accept it. And Ramirez is the conquistador and Plemons as the prince are both good. And one could honestly make the argument that Plemons steals the film away for Blunt and Johnson at times. Overall, the film's action keeps the film chugging along for a fairly entertaining time. However, in addition to the lack of romantic chemistry, the film does have pretty dicey CGI that one could wonder if the production was rushed or something. Also, some of the Portuguese pronunciations are pretty horrific. At the end of the day, though, almost any viewer should be able to find some sort of entertainment in this film, no matter how bad it can be at times. Jane Newton Howard's score is also pretty good as he's really no stranger to this kind of film. His fairly entertaining score is basically a combination of The Mummy and Indiana Jones music. He also does these two instrumental orchestral versions of Metallica's Nothing Else Matters, which are very good, but it somewhat takes audiences out of the film. Even so, the score is very action-packed from start to finish with a number of very, very intense sequences. Stopper, Streamer to Brazil, and Market Chase are the biggest highlights. Now, Howard does try to have a theme associated with Blunt's character and also the so-called romance of this movie. However, it's nothing really substantial. The score's biggest and best action track is very obviously the tree fight, which is obviously the climax of the film, where a massive orchestra and choir are joined by some Spanish guitar, which designates the arrival of the conquistadors. However, the score is honestly fairly long, and it isn't as good as his Riot and the Last Dragon composition from earlier this year. Overall, though, it, like the film, is still very entertaining. The film has success with its story, its direction, and its characters. There's also this small message in there about selfishness and sharing adventures with others, but it otherwise struggles with its details, more so in the filmmaking and the lack of romantic chemistry between the leads. However, one can really see how everyone was having a great time making this film, and the audience should as well. Now, what did you think? Let me know. Hit me up on social media. The formal review is on Facebook, Twitter, and the Gram, and also YouTube. The handle's all the same. It's at The Formal Review. And for anyone who has supported me on a financial basis, I thank you very much for supporting me in that way. For anyone who wants to support, you can go to anchor.fm forward slash the minus sign formal minus sign review and click support this podcast and any donation is appreciated. Thank you all again for tuning in. And until next time, wash your hands, get vaccinated, or if not, wear a mask. And I'll see you at the movies. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of The Formal Review. Cheers, and we'll see you next time.